Hello, everyone. I'm Irving D. Hill for Cox Communications, and a very warm welcome to you. We're delighted to have this visit with uh, President Samuel Wilson, President Hampton, Sydney University or College. We're so glad to see you. Well, it's my great pleasure, sir, to be here. And before we begin, would you permit me an initiative? I became aware of House Resolution 854 of 12 uh, February, uh, the Friday before Valentine's Day, when the House of Delegates of the General Assembly expressed their appreciation to you for all of your good public service in a unanimous resolution. And uh, I would like to extend my warm compliments yeah. to you on this occasion. Well, it was quite a thrill, and I'm about my heavens if it's coming from you. I'm, I'm simply uh, so pleased and honored uh, uh, to have you say that, and I thank you very much. Of course. Hand in Sydney, famous school. They're really very loyal. You know, it reminds me of VMI with their loyalty, the people that go there. I agree with you entirely. I think the ferociousness of the Hammond Sydney alumni's loyalty to each other and to the institution is equal only by VMI. <laughs> equal, that's right. Have you, when's the last time you were here? Have you done recruiting here? I was uh, here on the 29th of November when we had a meeting of uh, our loyal alumni in yeah. the Greater Norfolk area. I guess they were. 120, 125 of them out at Steinhilder's restaurant in uh, Virginia Beach. We had uh, <coughs> 26 prospective students with their uh, parents, and we talked to them and then talked to the crowd at large. And before the evening was over, 25 of the 26 had applied to Hamlet, Sydney. Man number 26 had come online giving us 100%. So we're very fond of this place. We have Joe Lee, the judge here, the graduate. Uh, Paul Tribble, of course. He's always very proud of his Hampton Sydney College. Uh, Dr. Bill you, Randy Hudgens. Mm -hmm. The place is full of prominent Hampton Sydney graduates. And they've all done well. They, they make great. Uh, you teach citizenship there. I know a great deal you focus on that. And, uh, very much so. Uh, the trademark of Hampton Sydney is, is leadership and citizens' responsibilities. And uh, Hampton Sydney students move out and take charge wherever they wind up. I'd like to tell you very, very quickly uh, about one Hamden Sydney class, the class of 1791, that exemplifies what we're talking about. Now, that's 1791. 1791. Okay. Class of <laughs> 1791, 16 years after the first students were in session. There were eight students in that class. One went on to become a governor. One became a congressman. One became a senator. One became a state Supreme Court justice. And indeed, he was the uh, chief justice of the state Supreme Court of Kentucky. Uh, one became a college president, the first president of the University of Georgia. One became the secretary of the Treasury in Washington. One became a wealthy Virginia planter. Uh, and subsequently was elected to the House of Delegates of the General Assembly in Richmond. And if you've been counting, I've given you seven. Number eight was a Hamden Sydney College dropout, but he went on to become a an authentic American national hero, uh, Major General of the United States Army, first governor of the Indiana Territories, uh, governor of Ohio, congressman from Ohio, senator from Ohio, minister to Columbia, and ultimately the ninth president of the United States. William Henry Harrison. Now, uh, Mr. Hill, there are not many colleges that can tell you that kind of story. But we are talking about public service now, and this, I think, is a good case in point. Well, that, that's remarkable, of course, and the heritage of that is well known. We want our viewers to, to really uh, take pride in that. The Virginia schools are recognized all over the world, but certainly Hamden in Sydney is very unique, and uh, we applaud that. But that, that's just truly remarkable. Unique also as the nation's oldest all-male institution. Indeed. But they have. Uh, the ones I've known have really just total involvement in community service, care, the ethics, they're very strong ethics, as you know, and you're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your boyhood. You were, you were kind of raised around the shadow of Hamden, Sydney, weren't you? I was born and raised <coughs> 12 miles from Hamden, Sydney, on a farm. Uh, Hamden, Sydney was a kind of a local mecca for us. I heard about it all my life from the age of earliest cognition. Uh, I grew up on the farm, plowing the fields, 
hoeing tobacco, cutting wood, flopping the hogs, feeding the chickens, and so on. Uh, I had to work very hard. We all did. This was uh, back in the Depression days. I was a, a Depression-era kid growing up on a 150-acre farm. But I learned the value of hard work. And while I despised it at the time, I think that that was one of the, one of the greatest things that my parents bequeathed to me. You said hard work. What, what was what was the give me a daily routine as far as time was concerned? Well, up you weren't watching the clock; you were watching the sun. Mm -hmm. Up in the morning, well before sunrise, uh, you had already taken care of farm chores and had had breakfast, and were in the fields working by the time the sun came up. And then you left the field at sundown. And then you had your farm chores again. And for a small boy, six, eight, nine, ten, twelve years old, uh, that was backbreaking work. Uh, there isn't. This was a tobacco farm and small grain. There's no crop that uh, uh, is as labor intensive as tobacco was. We no longer raise tobacco there anymore for, for good and pertinent reasons. But. Uh, the only time in the week that we had a chance to rest was on Sunday. Sunday was a green oasis. Everything stopped. My mother wouldn't even let us pitch a baseball in the front yard on Sunday. It was the Lord's Day. But the church was a very important part of it. Oh, that. yes. The church. There were three institutions, really, in, for me and for my contemporaries in those days. The family, of course, the church, and the local school, the local high school. Back in those days, just about each village had its own small high school. So the church was very, very key. It was the place where uh, farmers met on Sundays and exchanged news about the crops and told stories and so on. It was an important social occasion as well as a religious occasion. And the church was only a mile, a mile and a half way, uh, uh, away from the farm. My father was a Sunday school teacher, and I used to walk through the woods with him on the way to Sunday school class on Sunday mornings while he was sort of putting his Sunday school lesson together in his head. That was uh, setting a hard life, though, wasn't it? Yeah. But you know, uh, let me tell you how important it was. When I got into the Army at the age of 16, they told me that basic training was going to be hard, and uh, it was over before I really realized it was taking place. I eventually went to uh, uh, airborne school to become a paratrooper. They told me, this is going to be terrible. You know, it's hot down there in the valley of the Chattahoochee River. There are those flats there by Larson Field on the Alabama side across from the, the infantry school. Uh, Fort uh, Benning? Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Benning School for Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't all that hard. Sometime later, I uh, went to ranger training, and they said, this will kill you. The dropout rate is terrible. Uh, it wasn't all that hard. I kept waiting for it to get difficult. For me, all of these things that were supposed to be so hard were like being at the farm on Sunday. So you really, you were actually working, you were six or seven in, in, oh, yeah. in the field. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. there, a small boy could be very helpful. He could be a, a, a third hand for his father or his older brother, handing him things and working alongside him. Okay. Now, what did you have an awareness of hand in Sydney, even those days? Very much so. My family has been associated with Hamden, Sydney uh, from the beginning. Indeed, I sit in my office today and look out of a small white uh, uh, frame, wood frame building, story and a half, that was the law office of my four times great grandfather, mm -hmm. who was one of the original founders and who actually hosted the first planning meeting in that little office out of which Hamlet Sydney eventuated as a college. And we called that little building the birthplace. I would note that these people were Englishmen when they were doing this because we had not yet become a nation. Uh, and they were joined eventually by uh, an oldish Patrick Henry and subsequently by a youngish 26-year-old James Madison. These were the elite, the thinking people of the time in that area, recognizing the need and the for and the value of uh, higher education. And once they put their ideas in place in Hamden, Sydney, 
they went on to Philadelphia and they put these same ideas in our basic national documents that uh, further describe and, and guarantee our freedoms. So we, we are a tradition older than the nation, and we're very proud of it. We're very patriotic at Hamden, Sydney. As you were very kind enough to uh, recognize that uh, award I just received resolution of the General Assembly. And I've just think I've been up there about four weeks. Mm. And I often hear there's a Virginia way. Mm. Uh, Hamden, Sydney certainly played a role in that. What, what does that mean to you? Because you've been all over the world and, and through wars trials and tribulations for your nation? Uh, my father's uh, favorite type of person, the character whom he respected most, was the strong, silent individual. The man who, when aroused, could be a force fire of hurricane, but who not aroused and with nothing to be disturbed about, was gentle. There's a gentleness about Virginians. There's a, a politeness. Some people think it's exaggerated. I don't think it is. But uh, we've shown we can fight uh, through many, many wars. Uh, we have uh, shown that we can stand adversity. But even when we are poor, there's a gentility about Virginians that I think speaks to our origins and to our philosophic beliefs, our respect for each other. Uh, this, to me, is, uh, typifies who and what a Virginian is. Hamlet City was founded uh, the exact year. <laughs> That's an interesting question. We had students in class in November 1775. Well, the history books show us as being founded in 1776, but that was a fluke. In 1876, our uh, first national centennial, somebody wanted Hamden Sydney to rhyme with that occasion, and so we gave up 1775 and made it 1776. So if you look at the books, they'll say 1776. It actually began in 1775. Let's get in. We'll come back to Hampton Sydney quite a bit during this hour. Uh, we want to hear about your vision and so forth. We move along, but let's, uh, you're such a unique individual. Let's go back. We, we've established the fact that you uh, had this ethics and hard, hard work culture that was uh, your way of life with your family. Uh, then you, you went in the service. How'd you do that at 16? You weren't even allowed in that early, were you? Uh, 17, I think, was the lower stage, was it not? 18. 18 or 18 at the time, I think. I graduated from high school in May 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, I should add that my mother had been a, a public school teacher, and my father was a sort of country philosopher and storyteller, so we, I grew up with a mind nourished on books and stories, and a very strong feeling for our country. You know, the family felt that way, and it was we, we picked that up by osmosis, so to speak, a love for our country. Uh, I was planning in May 1940. Uh, a route which would lead me in the fall of uh, 1940 in September to Hamden, Sydney as a student. On the uh, 9th of June, in a Sunday, in the afternoon, I was twiddling with the dials of the old farm radio, and over the crackling static, I heard the voice of a man speaking, punctuated now and then by applause. The voice was the voice of uh, Winston Churchill, he was speaking on the floor of the House of Commons. This was his famous 4 June speech, and I was listening to uh, a rebroadcast over, I think, NBC Blue or something like that. And uh, you remember the speech. It was on the occasion of Dunkirk, and he was reporting uh, to Parliament uh, what had happened and how the force had been rescued, leaving their weapons and equipment behind uh, from the beaches of Dunkirk. And you recall, he said, we will fight them on the beaches, in the fields, in the streets, in the hills. We will never surrender. I heard those words, and I looked down and said, where's my hat? <laughs> there you go. There, and you there, were, 16. There, there went him to Sydney. Mm -hmm. The next day, it rained all day long. Rain is a blessed thing on the farm, because in addition to what it does for the crops, it gives you a little respite, a little rest. 
No, you, you were right near Farmville. You were right I was there. seven miles. Seven from miles from Farmville. So uh, I stole away after oiling the mule harnesses and sharpening hose, grabbed a couple of books and got up in the hayloft with the old stable. And uh, listening to the rain coming on, coming on the roof, I couldn't uh, couldn't get my mind on what I was reading. I kept hearing those words: "We will fight them on the beaches." I knew what Dunkirk meant. I knew what the threat was. I'd been watching the Germans rolling through the lowlands and into France. Uh, the next day, that same day, Monday, the 10th of June, the late afternoon, it was still raining. I guess it was about dark. I set off down the farm lane to the county road and hung a right out to 460 and hung another right. By this time, it was pitch dark and raining tarts. And I literally jogged all the way in Farmville, seven miles. Got there just before the National Guard uh, drill night was closed. Got in in time to raise my right hand. Did two years about my age and say I was 18. In short, this is 29th division? This is 29th yeah, division. 20, yeah. mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, we marched off the war, as you recall. Okay. So that's how it happened. You know, you've heard so much publicity about Tom Brokaw's book, uh, The Greatest Generation. What are your feelings about that? I'm so glad he wrote the book because it recognizes uh, people who, who serve their country in many, many different ways during the cataclysmic event of the 20th century, World War II. Uh, even in reading about these people, however, uh, they may have performed in the greatest fashion of any generation during the 20th century, but they are for the same young men that we have today. So I would drop a footnote from that title and say, Tom, you're right, but you're also wrong. Now, they're no greater than our young men today. They are no greater than the young men in Vietnam. And they are no greater than the young men in uh, Korea. Uh, they are all heroes. So it's wonderful that you recognize them because I was one of them, although I was in three different wars. But at the same time, let's not neglect uh, the recognition of the others as well. Uh, once you're out there on that uh, windy slope and somebody is shooting at you, doesn't make any difference which war it is. It can be a pretty lonely, frightened feeling. Now, let's go a little bit more your career. You went in the 29th Division. And did you do any training down this way? Yes. Uh, we were federalized on the 3rd of February, 1941, trained in Farmville for a couple of weeks, and then went to Fort Meade, Maryland, which began the training of our outfit. Uh, subsequently, we came down to uh, A.P. Hill, now Fort A.P. Hill, then Camp Hill, Trained there and went on maneuvers in North and South Carolina, North South Carolina maneuvers. We were on our way back to Fort Meade from uh, those maneuvers on the 7th of uh, December 1941. And I stuck, we stopped at South Hill to bivouac, and I got permission to go in and visit a distant cousin who informed me at the evening dinner table of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I knew then that my life had changed forever. Uh, <clears throat> We wound up very shortly after 7 December, uh, my regiment at uh, Camp Pendleton here at Virginia Beach, and we patrolled for a couple of months. We patrolled the beaches around Norfolk, riding in the edge of the surf after the tide had gone out on the wet, hard-packed sand in jeeps with machine guns mounted, uh, driving 40 miles an hour down the beach and gazing seaward with the binoculars and so on, watching for German submarines. I think the coldest I've ever been in my life. We were <laughs> submarines out there, too. You know, they were. They were there. Indeed, uh, I believe one sunk a freighter in the in sight of Virginia Beach during that general period. You know, it's not like fish in a barrel, you know, mm -hmm. it's what the records that I've read on all that. Mm -hmm. Then you went from there to, uh, uh, <coughs> you were well, lieutenant uh, 18. Which I wound up going to Officer Candidate School uh, in the spring of 1942, uh, serving there, bending, waiting for the, for the class to open and uh, getting promoted as a non-commissioned officer. I graduated from OCS on the 17th of June, 1942, at the age of 18, 
and was uh, selected from my class to remain behind as an instructor at the infantry school. Uh, one of the most educational experiences of my life because the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, we referred to it in those days as Benning School for Boys, was a very, very unique, not just training, but educational <coughs> institution. The program had been put together by General Marshall several years earlier. And then when war came, uh, the creme de la creme, the talent available uh, uh, for instructors at Benning, all came together there. We had college professors. We had the corporation CEOs. We had uh, movie actors, uh, radio announcers, uh, high school teachers, prize fighters, all-American football players, and so on. And uh, I, as a, a relatively uneducated 18-year-old, simply stood there in the middle of that aggregation of uh, magnificent people in awe, absolute awe of these people. But I knew that I was behind and had to learn, so I latched on to each one as opportunity would provide itself and learned from them. I learned to walk like one and talk like another and think like a third and write like the fourth and so on. I was like a lamprey eel, simply getting everything out of these folks that I could. It was one of the most uh, intense year-long learning experiences I've ever had. Do you uh, draw on any particular individual that, uh, that, that made an impression on you uh, that you uh, oh, that was, were able to emulate? Oh, that was a fellow by the name of McGinnis, who had been a famous uh, magician before the war and the master of ceremonies. He was just absolutely superb. I adopted some of his ma mannerisms and then watched the way he handled himself in front of people. That was one, one mm -hmm. example. Uh, I wound up, uh, as a result of uh, learning from all of these people and simulating uh, them, uh, their, their approaches, their styles, and copying from them, doing a fairly good job as an instructor myself so that some of my problems, as we call them, out on the field were frequently visited by uh, uh, very important persons coming through to include in the summer of 1943 President Roosevelt himself. Hmm. It was a wonderful experience. It was out of that experience that uh, <coughs> I wound up going into the Office of Strategic Services, which is a separate story, OSS. I want to hear about that. Well, what do you, uh, you hear so much about management leadership, but what do you, what, how do you really interpret leadership? You as a young man, 18 years of age, a second lieutenant, able to move people, have them uh, want to exceed uh, in that kind of stressful situation. And what, what do you feel those characteristics? You use two words, uh, management, leadership, and, and they're separate things, mm -hmm. managing and leading, uh, while complementary, uh, somewhat synergistic, are not the same things. Mm -hmm. I always have always felt that leadership is getting people to want to do mm -hmm. what you want them to do. And obviously you have to lead by example. Uh, this incidentally, we can come to this later if you wish, is probably the most important thing we're trying to do these days at Hamden Sydney College, is to teach young men to lead. And having been in that business for what, close to 60 years, uh, it is a very natural thing for me to want to take a young man and talk to him about how you motivate people, uh, how you uh, ensure that uh, to be an effective leader, uh, you have integrity, character, uh, that you can set the kind of example that you want the people following you to emulate. Uh, probably the most difficult leadership job in the world to come back to the infantry school and Benning School for Boys is uh, the challenge given to the second lieutenant rifle platoon leader who has to say to uh, 40, 45 men, follow me in the face of machine gun fire, artillery barrages, to keep going forward. Indeed, the uh, the motto of the infantry school was and still is, uh, follow me. Uh, that is the kind of leadership that I learned. Indeed, 
after World War II, uh, after my part overseas, I came back to Benning and was given the job of putting together a leadership program at the infantry school, which became later the basis for the leadership uh, uh, instruction at West Point. So you, you hit my button when you asked me questions. I didn't know that. I mean, it's always intrigued me. Uh, I found people that, uh, like Harry Train, I've always mm -hmm. admired. With Great a, man. Uh, I'm David, sure your paths have crossed. Yes, but, indeed. Uh, He's a good always friend. communicated, uh, always think of him and the contact once that uh, he agreed to do a relatively small speaking job for me. And mm -hmm. then it was something far more gigantic that they wanted to attend. He but, said, but, let me said no, but I've given you my word that I'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me intrude mm -hmm. to say that while Harry Train is not a Virginian, he has those characteristics that we were describing earlier, the characteristics that epitomize the capital B, Virginia. Well, they're, they're, they're just people that, that like you, I've long admired, Dr. LeHue and others, and Paul Tribble has uh, told me about your virtues and your characteristics, so I'm, it was a real treat for me to have you accept this invitation. No, but leadership's always intrigued me. It's, it's kind of, to me, always been a kind of feeling thing that people, you hear charisma and so forth, Harry Train and I recently went to Naval Academy and did a, a salute, spent a couple of days there where we hosted programs together. Mm -hmm. And they're very much into ethics uh, mm -hmm. there again. Uh, I say again, I guess they've always had it, but it certainly is a, a very strongly advocated in their teaching curriculum. Now, tell me about that with Hampton Sydney. Yeah. Well, uh, we have several programs at Hampton Sydney which continue to expand and become more comprehensive that address uh, the business of uh, ethics and leadership. Uh, we have the Center for Leadership in the Public Interest. We feel that uh, in some ways, we, you and I, our generation, uh, are leaving behind a bit of a mess for the young men who are going to inherit the 21st century. And we owe them all the preparation we can give them. So we are doing everything we can in a variety of ways to ensure that these young men are prepared to meet the, the difficulties of a very, very dangerous world that lies out ahead of us. Uh, <clears throat> we have a public service program, a certificate program. The students who go through it wind up with a little certificate inside their diploma when it's scrolled and handed to them at graduation. It involves a series of special courses they study Washington on character and integrity and uh, ethics. They study Jefferson's concepts of education, the enlightened citizen. They study uh, Madison on, uh, and his concepts on the limitations of government. Uh, they study a bit of Hamilton as well. And <clears throat> they go out on, in addition to the other courses they're required to take, they go out on uh, internships out in the public arena. They work for congressmen and senators and state senators and for the General Assembly, uh, not only in Virginia and in Washington, but in other states as well and abroad. We've had them work with the British Parliament and with the Australian Parliament, that kind of thing. They come back from these internships and present paper that has been assigned to them at the beginning. And if they defend it successfully before three professors and, a, and a, an audience of uh, other students, they get three credit hours for this internship. But this also gives them a chance to network and see things out in the real world while they're still in a student uh, category. And thereby, it enlightens them a bit as to the meaning of the things that they're learning in school. Uh, what they're reading in books and hearing from their professors become more significant as a result of their going out and sampling the outside world. The other thing that this does for them is it gives them a chance to locate possibilities for future employment in the public arena. This is one program which takes place on our Center for Leadership. We also have a student leadership development program. I have been at Hampton Sydney five years as president and had uh, been assigning students as uh, residence advisors and head resident advisors, and uh, students had been electing uh, the president of the student body, the chairman of the student court, the members of the student court to handle our honor system, uh, the student senate, and so on. A variety of leadership responsibilities there on campus. And I 
wakes up one night and sat up right in the middle of the bed and said, you've been giving these guys little workshops of two hours telling them what their responsibilities are, but you haven't been teaching and training them how to carry these responsibilities out. When you had the, the special forces, if you had done this with your non-commissioned officers, you'd have been fired. But when you were with the 82nd Airborne Division, if you had uh, simply appointed non-coms to responsibilities without giving them training, you would have been relieved. So I began, we began putting together a program that went around the entire year designed to teach these young students how to handle their own campus leadership responsibilities using case studies, examples for them to work their way through and solve, uh, studying the profiles of famous leaders in the past and identifying the characteristics and traits and features of those leaders that made them successful. Uh, it has become quite a popular program. And as a result, uh, the campus is running better because Hamden Sydney is largely run by students anyway. It's running better because we're teaching these young men how to lead. Those are two examples of the sorts of things that we're doing. We also work with the local high schools and uh, private academy and collaborative courses and bring students in on a, on a hand-picked basis uh, to join us in the classroom and try to pass some of these things on to them as well in their pre-college years. Uh, the advantage to them of doing this sort of thing is that uh, they gain credits toward high school graduation, but these credits can also go on a college transcript. So by the time they enter college, they all already can have six, eight, 10, 12 uh, college uh, credits uh, that they have gained while still in the high school status. So these are some of the things that we're doing trying to focus on, as I say, on these young men and to prepare them for the 21st century. This seems like a very difficult program at, at uh, Hammond Sydney. What kind of student do you look for that's able to fulfill these obligations? The students are largely self-selected. Uh, the student really has to bring two things, three things to us. He's got to have a sense of integrity or he won't make it. Our honor system is too tough. No lying, no cheating, no stealing, or you're out of there on the rail, period. So he's got to have integrity, character. Secondly, he's got to be intelligent enough to handle a very rigorous uh, curriculum. It's a tough college. Uh, it has a reputation. It is very, very tough. Mm -hmm. Grade creep has not hit Hamlet Sydney. The people know that it's tough. And thirdly, he's got to be motivated. I tell any student who asks me about Hamden and Sydney at the outset, don't come if you're not ready to work. Motivated. Let, let's hear a little bit. We talked about leadership management. Tell me what you feel motivation is. Is that a set of characteristics? Yes. Mm -hmm. Motivation is the desire to serve useful ends in one's life. At its higher levels, motivation extends beyond personal career interests that have to do with playing a positive role, a useful role in the society which give, give us birth. We, more than most citizens, whether we are young or old, owe a great deal to our country because we in the United States enjoy unparalleled opportunities uh, to determine our own destiny. And that's, that's not something we can just take for granted. Uh, it is something that we have to work at. We've got the greatest system in the world, but it doesn't work by itself. We have to work at it to make it work. And our people, our citizenry, they, citizenry have to be motivated to try to keep the system perpetuated and working the way our founding fathers designed it. Now, you may think I've diverged from your question, but I'm right on top of your question. Motivation springs from those convictions. You said with your career, you could have gone internationally, most any way you wanted. You were a three-star general, ended up a three-star lieutenant general in the United States Army, headed OSS, been in Hollywood, with your Marauders, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
played in the movie. Well, what fascinated you so much? We talked with some of that, but you've been rectors of universities and so forth. Why did you choose Hamden Sydney? Uh, that's the best question you've asked me since we've been talking. There's several reasons. One is, Hamden Sydney for me is family. It's where my roots are. And if you are aware of your roots, and if you derive strength and motivation from your roots, you try to keep close to them. Uh, secondly, Hamden Sydney has a tradition of leadership and uh, responsibilities of citizenship and social justice, all of which have been in place there from the very beginning. So I find it very natural to come out of almost four decades of public service, military service, service in the intelligence world, service in the, in the, uh, the, in the United States Foreign Service, uh, and wind up at Hamden Sydney, and everything for me sort of comes together there. I teach presently. It's difficult to be uh, the chief administrator and teach at the same time. You teach somebody uh, spying, intelligence, don't you? <laughs> spying? What do you call it, spying 101? That's what the kids call it. That's right, spying 101. But, uh, I enjoy teaching there uh, because everything that I have done in my life somehow plays into and is supportive of what I currently am charged to do. Uh, Hamden Sydney is small, round terms, a thousand students. It's an, as Jefferson called it, an academical village, self-contained post office, a fire department, a, a commons. Uh, everybody knows everybody. There's kind of an extended family atmosphere. You can't walk across the campus without being spoken to. This is, this is just an unwritten rule. You speak to everyone. And when you greet people and the hand comes up, the name comes out. Uh, none of this uh, business of, uh, but you don't remember my name, you know, that sort of thing. The hand comes up, the name comes out. Sam Wilson. I wake up in the morning and I turn over to my wife and I say, Sam Wilson. Uh, so, that kind of atmosphere and the fact that the, the overwhelming majority of our professors live within 10 miles of this academical village means that students have continuing access to these professors, to the faculty. Uh, the students, it is an all-male institution, which means that, among other things, bonding takes place much more tightly there as it does in the Rangers or in the Special Forces. These young men knocking heads together, bond. Uh, they may get rid of a girlfriend in 16 weeks, but a buddy from Hamden Sydney lasts them for a lifetime. So all of those things appeal to me as far as that little college is concerned. And it, it plays a role in our society far out of proportion to its size. Uh, who's who told us several years ago that we had more people in that pages uh, than in proportion to our size than any other college or university in the country. Uh, almost one in ten of our graduates either owns his own company or is the president or chief executive officer of somebody else's corporation. Uh, the statistics are amazing when you check off the number of, of lawyers, doctors, preachers, teachers, congressmen, senators, and so on that have come out of that one small school. Uh, there's something there that was put there by our founding fathers that put wind in our sails from the very beginning, and I knew it. So when I was invited after making a couple of speeches at Hamden Sydney following my military retirement to come out and uh, teach a course, put them all together in a course, and the course bifurcated into two and then trifurcated, and after about 10 years when uh, they asked me, would I assume the position of president of Hamden Sydney? That was no answer, but yes. So those are the reasons that the place appeals to me. Plus the fact my, my farm is 12 miles away, so I can... Have you kept that farm? Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you've had road scholars there on the faculty, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, John Brinkley, our college historian, was a road scholar. We had a, a distinguished uh, African-American in uh, about 1988 
as a Rhodes Scholar, Maurice Jones, who's now working in government in a very responsible position. And I, I think we've got several other uh, strong candidates right now. Are you culturally diverse? Yes. We are all male, but we are culturally mm -hmm. diverse. Maybe we're all male until about Thursday afternoon. <laughs> then, <laughs> then we we, we the Longwood, Longwood and Hollands and everywhere else. Huh? <laughs> Hollands, Sweetbriar, yeah. Randolph Macon Women's College, mm -hmm. Mary Baldwin, and so on. We're a very popular place on weekends. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have some of the finest, I mean literally finest, examples of African American manhood at Hamlet Sydney that I have seen anywhere. Tell me about that. Uh, these young men, uh, some of them, uh, people tend to think that Hamden Sydney is a, is a school for wealthy boys, and that's really not the case. And some of our African American lads come there. Uh, Excuse me, they've all done so well, they, you get that image, you see. No, I think that's part well, of the I mean that. They yeah. all do so that's well. Right. Uh, but the African American students who come there, in, in some instances, they come there in somewhat straightened circumstances. But we have a good financial aid program and a scholarship uh, uh, program uh, which allows us to attend to those who have merit and also to provide those who are truly needy with a significant assistance for them to get through. And it certainly may cost $22,000 a year, <coughs> but our uh, average cost, uh, it's an investment. That's right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you entirely. <laughs> But uh, the average need-based financial aid package is in excess of 16000 So a young man can uh, somehow scrape up a bar of the remaining 6000 and get there and make decent grades. He can get through Hamden Sydney, even though, uh, at first glance, it seems to be an expensive college. Tell us some of the individuals that have helped you, uh, that you admire and so forth around the Commonwealth that uh, certainly have been. I know Gene Dixon is one, because I know Gene, and Gene's been a good benefactor to you. Let me back up just a moment to say, uh, when that question is raised, I think immediately of my mother and father, mm -hmm. before, before we even start out. Uh, there were five of us, and we've all been successful, but we owe so much to our parents. And uh, I have tried, but I could not possibly be as good a parent as they were. They set an example that we'll, we'll never uh, fully emulate and certainly shall never forget. There were people in my boyhood who were important to me, uh, high school teachers. Some of them I remember so well. Practically all of them are dead now. I would love to be able to talk with them these days. Mm. I'd like to talk to you, too. Oh, what a success. <laughs> oh, I, I love them, and, I, and it was a reciprocal relationship. Then there were some powerful figures in the Army. I don't know how it worked out that way, but uh, I, was, I was known at one point as the youngest lieutenant and then the youngest first lieutenant. So that sort of pegged me. So the mighty would look down at the, you know, the junior one at the end of the table and recognize him and talk to him. I got to know a theater commander in the China Burma India Theater, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell. He was important to me. Uh, the commander of our outfit behind the Japanese lines, Major General Frank Merrill, for whom the outfit was named, Merrill's Marauders. Very important to me. You know, the movie they made regarding that. Yes, it was. Jeff, Jeff Chandler movie. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, he treated me as a son. His deputy, uh, Colonel Charles Hunter, who had been my boss at Benning when I was teaching in the infantry school, probably uh, my military father more than anyone else. Those figures were very, very important to me. And then as I, I became a, a Russian uh, linguist and a Soviet specialist in the immediate post-war era, uh, era uh, I began to find other mentors and people whom I looked up to in, in uh, government. Uh, and I worked for one as his deputy, as the uh, director of the Defense Intelli uh, Central Intelligence Ag Agency. Uh, Bill Colby, William E. Colby, just a wonderful, wonderful. I heard him make a speech once. Seems to be a very sensitive, fine man. Very, very fine man. Uh, tragically died several years ago, drowned in uh, in the Potomac. Uh, these people were all important. Former, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was a kind of a patron and very, very good to me. I got to know uh, several of our presidents, not well, but 
uh, when uh, Richard Nixon was the former vice president, he came on behalf of uh, uh, President Johnson to Vietnam on two occasions for sort of inspection tours. I was, the, uh, I was there in a foreign service capacity as a class one foreign service officer in the reserve with a personal rank of minister and uh, working as a kind of a chief of staff and pseudo deputy to Henry Cabot Lodge. Mr. Nixon stayed with me on those two occasions about uh, 10 days each time. I got to know him well. How do you feel about him? Of course, he's been controversial, but Armstead had a good Very man. complex mm -hmm. figure. Uh, paranoid. He had a streak of paranoia that was uh, very, very evident. Mm -hmm. Also, a tremendous quick study. A little story that will interest you, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> during my nearly four years in Vietnam, I used to keep in close touch with my, one of my brothers who owns and uh, operates radio station WFLO in Farmville, Virginia. My brother, John, would send me questions about the war in Vietnam, and I'd take my portable tape recorder and go out somewhere where there were interesting background sounds of a firefight or a plane taking off or something, and I'd chat with him. I would repeat his question and then answer the question, and when the tape came back to him, uh, he would uh, dub his voice where it rightfully belonged, so you got a dialogue between the two of us, and it, it fascinated his, li his listening audience. So one Saturday night I was telling uh, Mr. Richard Nixon, former vice president, about this, and he said, why don't we do this? And I said, oh, that would blow my brother's mind, Mr. Vice President. So the next day was Sunday, and we got to about 4,000 feet down over the delta, headed to visit a certain provincial headquarters, uh, I whipped up my tape recorder, and he and I began to chat. And every now and then, I'd hold up a three by five card and say, "John Wilson speaking," and then make a comment. And uh, Mr. Nixon would say, "Well, John, Sam, and I were talking about that just last night. It's so interesting that you raised that question." And I went back to Farmville. Right? And then he went oh, back to Farmville. I still have that tape. Yeah, what a lucky yeah. brother! Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was just great. Uh, one thing I would note: when Mr. Nixon came through. Uh, Manila on his way home. He st stayed on the phone during the hurricane until he finally punched through to my wife and two children who were staying a hundred miles away in the summer capital of Baguio just to reassure my wife that I was uh, all right and he said and Sam is doing a fine job. When he got to the United States he wrote my brother John. He wrote my son who was in the university, a senior at the University of Alabama he wrote my handicapped daughter, who was in the special school at the time. Uh, these are gestures of consideration and compassion on the part of an individual, revealing a side of his nature that uh, many people don't know about. There was, Richard Nixon was a very caring and compassionate man. Now, he was paranoid as all get out. And when you got on his paranoid side, then watch out. Most anything could happen. Okay. What do you see the vision for Hamden Sydney? Trademark of Hamden Sydney is leadership. Uh, in the time remaining to me there, I hope that we can get ourselves squared away in such a fashion that uh, our various programs, some already in existence and some uh, being currently being planned, will provide the young man who is interested in playing a leadership role in our society about as good a head start as he could hope to get anywhere. I believe that our primary resource of the United States is people. Uh, our strength does not lie in our natural resources or in our GNP or even in our culture or the fact that we make good movies and that people copy us around the world. Our strength is in the moral and spiritual fiber of our people. And I believe those of us who are getting a little long in the tooth need to turn around and invest every way we can in the upcoming generation so that when they inherit the future, uh, they are prepared 
And I believe that the future of Hamlet City College, with its tradition of this kind of service, uh, lies in preparing uh, a thousand young men for these kind of leadership roles. Obviously, we have a classical liberal arts uh, curriculum. I'd like to say just a word about that if we have time. Uh, quick thesis, Mr. Hill. We're looking at a Russia, which I know very well, which I spied against, and to which I was diplomatically accredited, uh, that is about to implode. And it's about to implode standing at the same crossroads that we stood in 1775 to 1787. We had gone through a revolution and we were becoming a new nation. And our founding fathers, our elite, our wealthy, our privileged few, were pledging their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the future of this new nation, to its uh, establishment and its sustenance. They were very unselfish. 1989, 1995, look at this same period in uh, the former Soviet Union. You've got the elite, the privileged few, the men of power, uh, a revolution taking place, and the chance to do the same thing for their country. And they're blowing it. They're blowing it and making the world a much more dangerous place to live as they miss this opportunity. So you ask yourself, why did our forefathers take the moral high ground and do the things they did? while the former Soviet communists inheriting their new government have become plunderers and criminals and people seeking their own selfish ends uh, with the future of the country to be damned. And the difference lies in our respective heritages. We have inherited from the Judeo-Christian ethic. We have inherited from the golden age of Greece we have inherited from uh, Roman law, English common law. We have inherited from the famous economists and political philosophers, uh, novelists and writers, thinkers all, Montesquieu, Rousseau, John Locke, uh, Jefferson, my favorite among them. We have uh, inherited from Washington and Jefferson and Madison and uh, Hamilton uh, we have inherited from Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. All of these people are in a line contributing the same sort of unselfish investment to the future of this, this great nation. And it is a great nation. The Russians never had this. They never had this past. They never shared in the Reformation. They never shared in the Renaissance. They are a country that has been plundered and overrun for almost 800 years. The Swedes, the Poles, the French, the Germans, the Japanese. They had a revolution in 1905 and they failed. They had a revolution in 1917 and they failed. A revolution in 1918 and they tried to hold things together as a communist country for 70 years and they failed because they lacked these ideals and these ideas that uh, belong to Western civilization. Now, Hamden Sydney, as well as many other small liberal arts colleges and universities and colleges around the country that focus on classical liberal arts education, reach back into that treasure trust of those ideas and implant them in the minds of our young. And as long as that process can continue successfully, we'll continue to exist as a free land. General, uh, we have about five moments. I wonder if you'd take the rest of this time, maybe, and talk to the young junior high schoolers, or middle schoolers, I think they call it today. I call it junior high when I was going. A high school, how to prepare their obligations and their parents' obligations and 
how we succeed in the kind of tradition that Hampton Sydney is trying to engender. That's a good one. And I wish uh, I had some notes in front of me to talk from because that's you're giving me a real challenge. Uh, several things I think I would tell them. is young folks uh, don't hate work. Don't consider work drudgery. Consider work fun. Get into the middle of work and become excited about it. Recognize that it is just as much fun as the games that you play. That you can develop a feeling of momentum, the wind at your back pushing you forward as you get into work and begin to succeed. And success is addictive. It'll push you and pull you forward as you feel yourself going. So learn to love work. And in the process of learning to love work, develop good work habits. Uh, learn to organize your time. Don't throw time away. Uh, the day that you have today is not going to return. It's gone. When the sun goes down, it's gone. Uh, another very, very important thing. Uh, we don't live by bread alone. It's nice to make a lot of money. It's nice to live in a nice house. It's nice to be comfortable. It's nice to be secure. But we are only fulfilled, really, when we're doing useful things for other people. That comes right out of the Bible. The second great commandment. Love your neighbor. Take care of other people. There'll always be the poor, the underprivileged, the sick, the halt, the lame, the blind. And those of us who have been blessed with good health and strong hands, uh, owe those people our care and our attention. Uh, it is the victim that the son of the carpenter left to us when he said, uh, a new commandment I leave unto you, that you love one another, that you love your neighbor. And this does not have to be something that we stand in the pulpit and be on the Bible about. We just have to live this way. And this, incidentally, is an American characteristic. Think about it. It's an American characteristic. When there's a flood somewhere, or an earthquake somewhere, somebody is in difficulty, who in the world is the first to respond? The American. We look out for each other. We tend somewhat as our society becomes increasingly mobile and moving so rapidly in these uh, hermetically sealed vehicles that streak up and down our interstate that we call cars to become disengaged from our fellow. But he's there. So my second point is, you know, love your neighbor. Yeah. Take care. General, I'm right on. As I said, I've had so many people uh, request you to come to this, uh, this area. Indeed, uh, you're a great warrior, statesman, soldier, president of a famous uh, college. So we pay, pay tribute to you and thank you, and, and we have a lot of respect for you. I want you to know that. Let me tell you what a privilege it is to be with you. Okay. I'm aware of your background too, oh, sir. Uh, you're no bad shakes. Well, well, so I'm honored, honored to be sitting here talking well, with thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Irving Hill. Thank you very much for joining us. Remember, we are your community connections. We offer you and we offer this great, great gentleman here, President Hampton City College. Thank you.